In the history of Chinese Bible translation, the name of one extraordinary man stands out, Joseph Sherashevsky. In this episode, we're going to take a look at his life and hopefully learn from him and be inspired by his example of perseverance and sacrifice. Most evangelicals know about the genius of Tyndale, but Sherashevsky has been all but forgotten even though he was at least as brilliant as Tyndale. He could speak 13 languages and read 20, and no man of that day equaled him in idiomatic mastery of spoken Mandarin. He had a command of nearly 10,000 Chinese characters, while the average Chinese at the time could use around 700. He was a master of Hebrew, having studied it since childhood. John Hikes of the American Bible Society called him the Prince of Bible Translators. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. Sherashevsky was born into a Jewish family in Tarage in Lithuania. His parents died when he was still a small child, and his relatives intended for him to become a rabbi. After he left for studies in Germany, though, he became a Christian by studying the Hebrew New Testament. In 1854, he emigrated to the United States, where he entered Western Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh in the following year. Now, much of what I'm going to be quoting and sharing in this episode comes from a biography by Muller that was published in 1937. Sherashevsky grew up very poor. One little incident from his student days he related to his son was that he had a pair of trousers that wore out, and he only had enough money for cloth, but not for a tailor. So he went and bought the cloth and fixed them himself. Because he was so poor, he didn't have a lot of money for transportation, and so he walked a lot. So when he went to study in Germany, he actually walked the entire way there, with his belongings in a pack on his back. It was a total of 900 miles that he walked to go study in Germany. In the spring of 1855, he experienced something like an emotional crisis about his faith. So There was a group of Christian Jews that he had been associated with who asked him to join them in their celebration of the Passover. Muller writes, The Passover meal was eaten with the accustomed Jewish ceremonies, but at the end each one rose and told what faith in Christ had meant to him. It is not hard to imagine how such an occasion recalling the most solemn associations of his boyhood and linking them to his newer convictions moved the young man. According to one who was present, his head slowly dropped into his hands as he listened to the words of his companions, and he gave every appearance of a person deeply stirred. Then his lips moved in silent prayer. At last he rose, and in a voice stilled with emotion, said, I can no longer deny my Lord. I will follow him without the camp. Now, having been born into a Jewish family, he was studying Hebrew since a very young age and visiting rabbinical schools until the age of 19. He himself wrote the following of his linguistic abilities. He said, Without priding myself upon the fact or claiming any special merit from it, and without the least idea of self-laudation, I may be allowed to state that my knowledge of the Hebrew qualifies me perhaps more than any other missionary now in China, to undertake such a work as the translation of the Old Testament. Being a Jew by birth and having enjoyed in earlier years a good Jewish education, I know Hebrew better than any other language. As to my knowledge of the Chinese, I hope I possess the average knowledge of it of most missionaries. End quote. So very soon after his conversion, he developed an interest in going to China to translate the Bible into Chinese. And this surprised a lot of people. He was very specific. So when he went to the United States to study, he became an Episcopalian and eventually was sent to China by the bishop. Now, you have to remember that back in these days, a trip to China would take at least half a year. So on the way, he dedicated himself to learning Chinese as much as possible. 
He said, this study was found an invaluable resource to keep off NUI. And there's a tradition that Sherevsky on landing astonished native teachers by his ability to write good classical Chinese. And here are some things that he said about language learning. In my humble opinion, it will require at least 18 months very hard study before one would be able to express himself on any topic not belonging to the routine of common life intelligibly and clearly in a foreign tongue. He also said, There have been, indeed, missionaries who, almost immediately after their arrival, having picked up a few broken phrases, commenced, as they supposed, to preach the gospel to the heathen. But preaching that most likely consisted in nothing more than uttering some sounds wholly unintelligible to the hearers. It can fairly be asserted that preaching the gospel in such a manner is exhibiting a zeal without much knowledge. The gospel of Christ is to be made honorable in every respect. Now, to preach in an incomprehensible gibberish to such a people as the Chinese, who perhaps more than any other people are fastidious about language, is anything but making it honorable. He went on to say about learning Chinese, Great patience and perseverance are most necessary. A missionary who has gone out or wants to go out to China must fully make up his mind to be engaged the first five years at least, in very laborious study. It is very hard work, but it must be done. Finally, in one conversation later in life, he said, People ask me how to learn Chinese. I know only one way, nine hours a day. And Moeller writes about him, To less earnest students who complained of the difficulties of the language, he would exclaim with some irritation, You think Chinese difficult? You ought to try Mongolian, which, as we will see, was what he did himself. At first, however, his study was confined to three Chinese languages, the Shanghai Colloquial, the Mandarin, and the Literary Language, or Wenli. Now, during his time in China, the United States went through the Civil War, which you can imagine was devastating for foreign missions. So all the churches stopped giving for around four years, and so the Board of Missions also stopped sending any funds to China during those four years. Now, when Sherashevsky set out to translate the Bible, the American Bible Society supported him and also paid for a Chinese secretary to work with him. His mission society was the American Episcopal Church Mission. And Dr. Tsetche writes, He took the complete devotion to this task so literally that he hardly ever wrote reports to his mission society or the ABS for fear of being interrupted. For the same reason, the growth of his congregation during his 12 years in Peking was limited to one family and a lad. The work on the first draft of the Old Testament was finished in 1873. The final revision was done by Sherashevsky himself and possibly to some degree by another guy named Blodgett. According to Sherashevsky himself, in dogmatical questions he did not use modern criticism, but generally followed the orthodox interpretation, which he in most cases found in the English authorized version. He described his greatest authority, though, as the Hebrew text, followed in much less importance by the Greek Septuagint, the Latin Vulgate, and the translations of De Vete and Loth. In his later classical translation, however, he claimed to be much closer to the Hebrew text than in the Mandarin translation. Now, just as a side note, as he began learning more about the situation of missions in China, he had a conversation with one of the highest Mandarins, who told him that the Chinese government had not much objection to Protestant missionaries establishing themselves anywhere, seeing that their only object seems to be to exhort the people to be good, whereas the Roman Catholic missionaries seemed to endeavor to create a political party in the empire and to alienate the natives. Now, during his time in China, people were starting to realize more and more how strategic Mandarin was for Bible translation and missions. He said, In those regions where peculiar dialects are spoken, it is generally understood by the educated classes and is, moreover, the official language throughout the whole empire. 
From this, it will be easily perceived that a version of the scriptures into this dialect is almost beyond comparison in point of importance and usefulness to versions into other dialects. It will really be the scripture in the living spoken language of the country. Mandarin is spoken by more human beings than any other language in the world. Now, this guy wasn't just a Bible translator. He was also a preacher. Late in 1867, Sherzhevsky purchased a Buddhist temple outside the west gate of the city, repaired it, and converted it into a chapel, all for the amazingly small sum of about $900. Here, he regularly preached for the next seven years. And Muller also shares with us this really interesting little snippet about a journey he took. So listen to this. Several months before buying the temple, that is, in the spring and early summer of 1867, he took an inland journey of extraordinary interest and not a little risk and excitement. In the city of Kaifeng, capital of Honan province, about 450 miles southwest of Peking, there was at the time and had been for some centuries a colony of Jews. Indeed, they professed to have entered China before the beginning of the Christian era. They were discovered by Jesuits in the 17th century. Dr. W.A.P. Martin had paid them a visit early in 1866. He found that they estimated their numbers at from three to 400, that they were for the most part small shopkeepers or artisans who had suffered much from the recent rebellion that having no money to repair a ruinous synagogue, they had torn it down and sold the timbers, that their last rabbi had died 30 or 40 years before, and although they still had in their possession copies of the Hebrew scriptures, none could read them. They have entirely lost their religion and are scarcely distinguishable in any way from the heathen. They have idols in their houses and ancestral tablets, One has become a Buddhist priest. They intermarry with the natives and have ceased to practice the rite of circumcision. In features, dress, habits, religion, they are essentially Chinese. They cannot read the law, although the manuscripts are still in their possession. Now, you might be wondering at this point, what about this guy's wife? What about his family? Well, he went over to China single. But after some time, some new missionaries were sent over. One of them was a young woman. And Moeller writes that there is a legend still current in China that when the two bachelors in the mission, Sherzhevsky and Bishop Williams, heard that a charming, capable, young, unmarried woman was about to arrive as a missionary teacher, each determined to make her his wife. But while Williams waited at the wharf in Shanghai to welcome her, Sherzhevsky took a launch and met her steamer at Wusung, 12 miles down the river. Before he and the lady reached the dock, they were engaged to be married. Where are you going? asked his friend. I'm going to be married, he replied. Have you met the lady? his friend asked in some amazement. No, said Sherzhevsky, but I'm going to marry her. And off he went. Now, in 1867, there were no railways in China, and the usual method of travel between Peking and Shanghai was by cart to Tianjin and thence by coastwise steamer. But it was in the midst of winter. The gulf was frozen and no steamers were running. A long journey overland by cart or sedan chair was but little speedier than walking, and for a vigorous person, less comfortable. It was also more expensive. So, Sherzhevsky decided to walk. Shanghai is almost 900 miles from Peking. After walking about 700, he reached Yangtze, where he was invited aboard an American gunboat and taken the rest of the way. So apparently, after only about two weeks of the arrival of Susan Mary Waring, their engagement was announced, and in less than three months, they were married. Mrs. Sherzhevsky later said she was not a little embarrassed when, at missionary meetings in the United States, someone would say, Did your husband really walk 700 miles to marry you? She was a remarkable and refreshing young woman. When she applied to the mission board for appointment, she wrote the following. It is my desire to become a missionary to China. I am a member of St. Anne's Church, Brooklyn, and have been a communicant of the same for 12 years. 
I am a graduate from the Packer Collegiate Institute, class of 55. My profession is that of a writer. I am 29 years old. My health is good. I enclose a letter from my pastor, Reverend Lawrence H. Mills. Should any further testimonials be required, I am prepared to furnish them. And her pastor's letter said the following about her. She is one gifted with a fine intellect, good judgment, and most amiable disposition. She has labored for years in church work, most assiduously, most unobtrusively. End quote. Now, of course, her patience and amiableness were going to be tried by marrying a man who is brilliant, but a little difficult at times. She admitted that her patience was sometimes tried by his ability to concentrate so hard on his translating that he would hear or see nothing else. He would suffer no interruption, no matter how urgent she thought the occasion for it to be, and it was always a task to get him to bed. She would often go in search of him at 2 a.m. and find him sitting before the stove in his study, repeating Chinese phrases to himself, wholly unaware that the fire had gone out, end quote. Now, there's this tendency within mission organizations, because they're usually short on personnel, to take brilliant men like Sheryshevsky and put them in leadership positions, even though they're uncomfortable and not as productive in those sorts of positions. And this happened when Sheryshevsky returned to the United States for health reasons in 1875, and the episcopate called him to be the bishop of Shanghai. He initially refused this call, but because they couldn't find anybody to take this position, eventually two years later, he gave in and accepted the call, mainly because he was assured of financial support for his dream of building a college for the education of the Chinese. So on October 31st, 1877, he was consecrated bishop in Grace Church, New York. And he remained serving as Bishop of Shanghai until 1883. Now, he had to resign from being Bishop because of a sunstroke that he suffered in 1881. And this made him increasingly incapacitated until he eventually became paralyzed in every limb and lost much of his ability to speak. He ended up sitting in the same chair for 25 years and he slowly and painfully typed out with one finger a Mandarin translation of the Old Testament and an Easy Wen Li translation of the whole Bible. So you may ask, why didn't he have a secretary that was assigned to work with him? Well, as you can imagine, the Bible societies and the missions lost confidence in his ability to do the work after his paralysis. They assumed that the illness had affected his mind and his perseverance and his work ethic too much to really invest in a Chinese helper to work with him. So in 1887, he started the revision work all by himself, typing out the Chinese in Roman characters so that later somebody could help him turn that into Chinese characters. Sherzhevsky spent 32 years of his life solely on Bible translation more than anyone else in the course of Chinese Bible translation. This perseverance in the face of great hardship gave his fellow missionaries and later historians the highest respect for his work. After suffering paralysis, he spent a lot of time trying to find some kind of cure, some kind of alleviation for the suffering. This was the day and age of the water treatment or water therapy, where you could go to these places as a sort of rehab center. And they would do all kinds of things with water. He spent about two years in Geneva at one of these places. And they're very expensive. And after two years, he could only take a few small unsteady steps alone and had to be guarded very carefully for fear of a fall. Someone had to walk behind him with hands on his shoulders or two people support him, one on each side. He could stand alone only when leaning against a wall for the rest of his life. He had to be carried up and down stairs and lifted into bed or into a chair or a conveyance. He could move his arms and fumblingly pick up objects if they were not too small, though only after several attempts in each case. He could sign his name if his wife held and guided his hand. If his food was cut up for him, he was able to eat with a spoon 
using a piece of bread for a pusher. This one-finger Bible, as it came to be called, was a manuscript containing more than 2,000 pages. It was written on a typewriter with the middle finger of his partially paralyzed right hand. He said during this process, I am never without pain. I do not care to live. And when I have done this book, I pray the dear Lord to take me to himself. On October 15th, 1906, at 10 minutes past five on Monday, Bishop Sheroshevsky quietly died. The cause of death was reported as diabetes. He had worked until the Saturday morning before and had completed his reference Bible, all but the final placing of the references to five chapters. Four years before his death, the bishop had said to Dr. Hikes, I have sat in this chair for over 20 years. It seemed very hard at first, but God knew best. He kept me for the work for which I am best fitted. When word of his death reached the United States, Dr. John W. Wood, in an editorial in The Spirit of Missions, wrote, It was a notable and wonderfully useful life. In all the history of the church, there have been few more remarkable. It had been, as his wife put it, a life laborious and full of strange vicissitudes. Now, what about the public reception of his translation? It was almost unanimously highly praised and welcomed. Sherzhevsky is possibly evaluated more highly than almost anyone else in the history of Chinese Bible translation. He was called the Prince of Bible Translators, and in one publication of the British Foreign Bible Society, he was called one of the world's greatest Bible translators. This is mainly due to his uncommon abilities and remarkable achievements. Dr. Tsetche writes in his book, The Bible in China, The most prominent of the changes that Sherzhevsky made in his Mandarin revision was the consistent translation of Yahweh with Chu instead of the transliteration Yehehua. In his earlier edition, Sherzhevsky had already used Chu as well, but had retained Yehehua where it appeared together with God as in Yehehua Tianzhu, Jehovah God, in Genesis 2.4, or with Lord, as in Chu Yehehua, Lord Jehovah, in Genesis 15.2. In the revised edition, he omitted Yehehua even in these passages. The Bible societies, and especially the British Foreign Bible Society, however, were afraid that this would not be approved of by some missionaries and cause a new controversy in the midst of the translation of the Union version. So, they decided to switch back to Sherzhevsky's old system. From today's viewpoint, though, Sherzhevsky proves to have been very far-sighted with his translation of Yahweh, which most of the modern Chinese translations render similarly as Chu or Lord. Finally, Muller writes, The Bishop's Mandarin Reference Bible was published by the American Bible Society in 1908, his Easily When Lee Reference Bible in 1910. So great was the initial demand that the first printing of the Mandarin version of 19,000 copies shortly followed by 8,000 more was speedily exhausted. When the Union Mandarin Bible eventually came out and became the standard Mandarin Bible for China, it was clear that the basis for it was Sherzhevsky's work. And there seems to be some doubt as to whether the Union translations are really an improvement on his. Sherzhevsky not only left a huge legacy in Bible translation, but he also changed the history of education and churches in China. Because he founded a missionary college, this was the beginning of a series of foundations which have sounded the characteristic note of modern missions, especially of modern American missions in the Far East. It was also the beginning of modern higher education, missionary and non-missionary in China. He said, I cannot say too much about the importance of having well-educated people to labor in this field. It makes the greatest possible difference in every way, both in respect to their usefulness, their ability to acquire the language, and the impression that they make upon the native mind. 
it may be laid down as an axiom that men and women of ability will do good work. Of course, the piety and devotion I take for granted. Shershevsky is buried in Tokyo, Japan, and he is honored with a feast day on the liturgical calendar of the Episcopal Church in the USA on the 14th of October. So that sums it up for Shershevsky's life. There's a lot more to be said of his biography. The book by Muller is in the public domain. It's called Apostle of China, and it was published in 1937. Once again, a big thanks to Dr. Jost Tsecha, who pointed me to this man's life for the first time in his book, The Bible in China. Over at this podcast, we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.